Okay, so uh, Steve will talk about the emergence of time in timeless quantum gravity. Um, let's try moving the slides. Um, so it works here. Um, can somebody give a thumbs up uh, who's out in the audience? Well, there's one person. Um, um, let's hope that, that that's working. Okay, so okay. go ahead, Steve. Thank you for the invitation. Uh, time, the nature of time in quantum gravity is mysterious. I won't wear this while I talk. Uh, is mysterious and poorly understood. Of course, after the past couple of days, I guess I could say that about time in general, but quantum gravity has its own peculiar problems. I'm going to spend about half of this talk introducing those problems and then the other half on a very tentative uh, idea of how to solve them um, with one oversimplified example as a proof in principle. So although I, oh, I should also say, this is not my usual audience. So uh, first I apologize if I say things that you already all know, but also if I start assuming that you know things that you don't, I encourage you to interrupt at least for clarification. Okay, so I'm going to be talking about time in quantum gravity, but let's start with time in classical general relativity. It's easiest to say what time is not. Time is not whatever is labeled by some time coordinate T. Uh, the reason for that is that coordinates are just human made labels. A uh, point in space time doesn't come with a little name badge on it. And the choice of the coordinate is completely, almost completely arbitrary. More precisely in general relativity, what specifying the coordinate T means is specifying a time slicing, that is a split of space time into hypersurfaces of constant time. But for a general curved manifold, there's no preferred slicing. Uh, and that means there is no preferred time coordinate. Uh, among other things, this means that a translation in coordinate time, t goes to t plus one, is equivalent to a coordinate transformation, t prime equals t plus one. It doesn't have any physical meaning in itself. And one of the technical places that shows up is that the Hamiltonian in general relativity, which is the generator of time translations, is zero. So those are features that are often referred to as part of the problem of time and quantum gravity. So we can ask whether classical general, rel general relativity already has a problem of time. And the answer, at least empirically, is no. Uh, relativists have no trouble talking about time dependent processes within the theory. When we talk about uh, the advance of Mercury's per perihelion, we're talking about the location of Mercury as a function of time. When we use a network of gravitational wave detectors to locate a collision of black holes, we're comparing the times at which the signals uh, reach. Uh, the different uh, detectors. The way that we do this in practice is based on this aphorism that I've seen attributed to Einstein, although I haven't found a primary source, that time is what's measured by a clock. Uh, when we talk about the advance of Mercury's perihelion, for instance, the way that we actually do that is to set up, uh, to, to describe, for example, um, at location X on the surface of the earth, set up a radar transmitter and receiver and an atomic clock, then if a radar pulse is sent at time T1 as measured by that clock, 
its reflection from Mercury will be received at time t2. And as long as all of our predictions are converted into language of that type, there's no trouble with dealing with them. There are, of course, many different kinds of clocks. There are atomic clocks, for instance. There are also gravitational clocks. Simplest example, traditional, is that the year is a gravitational measurement. It's the period of the Earth's orbit under the gravitation of the sun. But there are many other possibilities. For example, in an expanding universe, it is usually true that the local rate of expansion serves as a good clock. Good clocks agree. The reason this works is that good clocks agree. And so the actual description of the physical phenomenon doesn't depend on a choice of clocks. In quantum gravity, things get more complicated. Um, first of all, clocks can run backwards. Uh, more precisely, if a clock is built out of matter that has positive energy, then in any time interval, there's a finite probability that it will run backwards. You can make clocks more accurate, less likely to run backwards by increasing their mass. But that has its own problems. That's basically because of the energy time uncertainty relation. But that has its own problems because that mass then affects the curvature of the space time that you're interested in. Clocks back react, accurate clocks back react more strongly. That means that you aren't making a measurement of time except by affecting the, the time that you're measuring. There is a possible exception to this, which is certain gravitational clocks, which have energy zero. Uh, but for those cases, you get into a further uh, problem, which is that uh, those clocks are usually not defined for all possible space times. They usually exist only for particular ones. As a simple illustration, if you think about the measurement of the year in terms of the Earth's orbit. That only works in a space time where the Earth is in an orbit and it's in an orbit with a period of one year. But in the quantum theory, you can have superpositions. You can have a state in which there's some probability that the Earth has its present orbit, some probability it has a different orbit, some probability that it was ejected from the solar system four billion years ago. Um, you can also, and this doesn't even require general relativity, but it's natural within quantum gravity. Uh, you can construct space uh, states in which you have superpositions in which events uh, come with different, different causal orders. And that, in fact, has been done experimentally. Um, one place that this shows up, again, is that the constraint that the Hamiltonian is zero in general relativity is much stronger in quantum gravity. It tells you that the Hamiltonian, which is a generator of time translations, acting on any physical state gives zero. And that means that in some real sense, states are time independent. So this is a problem that's much worse in, in quantum gravity than classical general relativity. So the proposal that I want to discuss is whether it's possible to somehow take the at least somewhat better under control idea of time from classical GR and transplant that to quantum gravity. So to do that, I'm going to have to take two detours in classical physics. Uh, well, one in classical physics and one in quantum theory. Uh, the first is the idea of covariant phase space. So starting point, uh, classical equations of motion from Newton's F equals MA to the field equations of general relativity to quantum field theory are 
essentially always second order in time derivatives. They involve two time derivatives, no more. There is a deep reason for this. There's a 150 year old theorem by Osugradsky that shows that with certain understood exceptions, theories that have more than two time derivatives don't have any stable solutions. What this means is that the initial data that you, use, you need to describe a solution of these field equations is a set of initial positions or generalized positions and a set of their first derivatives, initial velocities or initial momenta or generalized momenta. In GR, those are, an, for example, an initial spatial geometry and its extrinsic curvature, which is basically its first time derivative. The set of such initial conditions is called phase space. And technically it has uh, an interesting geometric structure. It's a symplectic manifold. That means that there are Poisson brackets defined on it. But there's another way of looking at phase space which actually goes back to Lagrange, uh, which is that pick, pick an initial time slice any way you want. If I give you a point in phase space, that is uh, initial data on that time slice, you can evolve it forwards and backwards in time using the field equations to get a full classical solution of the field equation. Conversely, if you give me a classical solution, I can just look at what that solution looks like on this initial time slice and get initial data. That means that there is an isomorphism between the phase space as the space of initial data and the space of classical solution. This space of classical solutions is what's sometimes called the covariant phase space. So from a, from my guess of a philosophical perspective, these look very, very different. One of them is initial data evolving in time. The other is a whole solution. It's uh, everything, everywhere, all at once. Uh, but physically, for a physicist, um, in all known classical physical theories, they're isomorphic. We can freely move back between, uh, back and forth between uh, descriptions. The second ingredient that I need is maybe more familiar, which is just something about the role of time in quantum mechanics. A quantum theory has two basic ingredients. It has states or wave functions, probability amplitude, and it has observables, which are operators that act on those states. You can put the time dependence in either of those two. The more familiar picture, the Schrodinger picture, has the states time dependent uh, with their time dependence given by the Schrodinger equation. But there is also a Heisenberg picture in which the states are time independent and it's the observables that are time dependent. And that's somewhat closer to a classical description where it's position and momentum that change in time. For most systems, you can go freely back and forth between these pictures. There are some cases, for instance, some situations involving uh, quantum field theory and curved space time in which they're not equivalent and in which the Heisenberg picture works better. So the basic proposal is that quantum gravity is most naturally understood in a Heisenberg picture. The states are time independent. That's what this statement that the Hamiltonian annihilates the states means, that doesn't get rid of the problem of time, but it moves it to some place that it's a little bit easier, which is understanding time dependent observables. 
so here is the outline of the proposal. Uh, this looks more complicated than it really is because I tried to include all of the steps. First step, start with covariant phase phase. That's a time independent quantity because it's a space of entire classical solutions, not solutions at any particular time. Uh, you need to somehow describe this. You need to find coordinates on covariant phase space. One way to do that is that initial data on some arbitrary time slice give you coordinates, but that's not ideal because that gives special status to some initial time. Um, the more general way to think about this, which is very hard in practice, but should work in principle, is that you have some set of field equations you find their general solution that'll depend on some integration constants, those integration constants determine which solution you're on. So they give you a set of coordinates. As I said, this covariant phase space has Poisson brackets. You can choose canonical coordinates on the phase space so that the Poisson brackets are something simple. Uh, they're nice mathematical theorems that say you can always do this. Uh, that gives you a set of uh, coordinates on your phase space. You declare these to be operators in some quantum theory and you quantize the way you usually would. That is that you take your states and you choose, for example, a position representation, you make your states functions of half of the variables on the covariant phase space. Those states are time independent because they're functions of these time independent coordinates on the time independent covariant phase space. So that naturally gives you a Heisenberg picture. To construct operators, you choose a classical time slicing, anyone you want that makes sense on your space of solutions. Then on each time in that classical choice, there are some observables in general relativity. Those would be again, the, the spatial metric and it's uh, first time derivative. The values of those observables depend on which slice you're on. So they depend on a classical choice of a time coordinate and they depend on which solution you're on. So they depend on these uh, coordinates on covariant phase space. Make those into operators. Those are time dependent operators where time is a classically chosen time that specified your time slicing and you're most of the way there. That gives you a Heisenberg picture. You can go from that Heisenberg picture to a Schrodinger picture in a standard way. Uh, you now have these time dependent observables. You take a maximal set and you find their eigenvalues and uh, their eigenstates. And any wave function can be written as a superposition of those. That gives you time dependent wave functions where time again is the time chosen classically. What happens if you choose a different classical time? This is the place that quantum gravity usually gets into trouble. If you could somehow choose a preferred time, we'd be okay well, we'd be no worse than we are with time in general, but we don't have a preferred time. So what if I do this same procedure uh, using a different classical time slicing? I'll get a different set of time dependent observables. They'll, they'll give a different Schrodinger equation with a different Hamiltonian, but they're guaranteed to be equivalent as long as I'm asking questions that make sense in both time slicings. 
because both of them are equivalent to this same Heisenberg picture. So that is at least a step in the right direction. Now, the way I've described this is very abstract. What I want to do in my last, how much time do I have left? Oh, okay. Oh, I'm going faster than I thought. Yeah, okay. Um, so what I want to do in the last maybe 15 minutes is to give a specific example of this, uh, which is going to actually relate back to uh, the, the talk by ANSI on Monday about asteroids. Uh, I want to give an example from two plus one dimensional quantum gravity, that is gravity in two space dimensions plus one time. Now, this is a vastly oversimplified setting. Uh, in three space time dimensions, gravity has a number of very special features that make general relativity much, much simpler, and in particular, that make it exactly solvable. Uh, the first of these is that the vacuum Einstein field equations imply that the space time is actually flat. That's very strong. It means that there are no gravitational waves. It means that there is no Newtonian limit to the theory. Uh, there are no propagating, propagating degrees of freedom. But there is still is some dynamics coming from global geometric degrees of freedom. And the basic conceptual issues are still the same. We still don't have any preferred time slicing. Uh, we still have um, the fact that physical clocks can run backwards, that they back react on the space time. All of those problems are still there. And so this is a very simple setting, but one in which the conceptual issues stand out because they're most of what's left. So I'm going to talk about the simplest example, which is a uh, two plus one dimensional space time in which the universe is spatially compact and has the topology of a torus. So let me first say a little bit about how you build a torus. So start with a square. Uh, identify opposite edges. That is, you roll it up into a cylinder. You'll now have two edges remaining, which are circles. Glue those together, you'll get a torus. Now, the way that I've described that, if you try to do that with a sheet of paper in uh, in our nearly flat space, you have to stretch the, the thing to, to attach the two uh, circles together. And so you get a space that has curvature. But that's not a property of the torus itself inherently. That's a property of trying to fit it into um, our three-dimensional space. The other way to do this is to say, take this same piece of paper and instead of physically connecting the opposite edges, just declare that they're identified, that something coming out of one edge automatically pops in on the opposite side. This is the game of asteroids. This is actually commonly called the uh, video game model of a torus. Now, 
I did that with a square sheet of paper because that napkin happened to be uh, square, but you can be, be more general. In general, you can take a parallelogram and identify opposite edges this way. Different parallelograms are specified by, first of all, by an overall scale, which is going to be changing in time in an expanding universe. But apart from that, from a single complex number or two real numbers, which are just the specification of one corner of the parallelogram, you put the base on the, the uh, um, x-axis, uh, you specify one corner, you say it's a parallelogram. Those two numbers or that single complex number, uh, it's called the modulus of the torus. And there is a subtlety that different values of the modulus tau can give you equivalent tori. If I take that cylinder and I twist one edge by uh, two pi rotation and then glue it back, it's equivalent. Um, those transformations are called modular transformations. They turn, or large diffeomorphisms, they turn out technically to be very useful here, but that's really just a technical point. So that's the torus, that's the spatial cross section of this universe. What about the whole universe? We want to do classical phase space. So we want a covariant phase space. So we want a description of the entire solution of an entire solution. Well, for a static case, what I would do is just take a pile of those napkins and stack them on top of each other. And then just say that I'm identifying opposite sides. More generally, the general way to do this involves instead instead of just a, a what do you call it a solid with two equal sides and a third side that's different. Uh, I don't don't remember enough of my elementary school geometry to know what that's called. But instead of that, what you can do is cut out a wedge from three-dimensional space-time and identify opposite points by a combination of a translation and a Lorentz boost. And it takes a little work, but you can show that this gives you the most general flat two plus one-dimensional space-time. The details aren't important here. You end up with a picture that looks pretty much like that. Uh, the important thing is that for the torus, you needed a single complex number, the modulus, or two real numbers to identify the torus. Here you need four real numbers. You have two translations because you're identifying two pairs of sides and you have two Lorentz boosts. So that gives you a set of parameters which completely describe the solution. So those are the coordinates on covariant phase space. As I said, covariant phase space has a natural set of Poisson brackets. Again, it's just a calculation to work these out. It turns out that with this choice of parameters, the Poisson brackets are really simple. And that means that it's really easy to write down the corresponding quantum theory. You just take some of them to be functions and the, the, and the conjugate pair to be derivatives, just like ordinary quantum mechanics. That gives you your Heisenberg picture. The wave function is a function of half of these parameters. That's all it is, it's time independent. That's the wave function. Now we want to get to time dependent operators. So that means choosing a time slicing classically. Uh, I've shown a time slicing here. 
And that's a standard choice. It's something called York time or a constant mean curvature slicing. I can go into details if anyone wants later, but it's pretty standard choice. Uh, it is a simple calculation to work out what the modulus is on each of those rectangular pieces or parallelogram pieces that form the torus at a constant time. It depends on which slice you're on and it depends on which solution you're on. And that's the answer. The moduli obey a Heisenberg equation of motion with a Hamiltonian that has some nice classical meaning as an evolution operator between those particular slices. And you can go to a Schrodinger picture by just saying you have these moduli. Let's look at the wave functions that describe a space with different definite values of the moduli, but not of their time derivatives. That's a position representation where you have definite values of position and uncertain momentum. Solving that, it's a differential equation. It's not too hard to solve. You can find the general wave function of that form. And again, a little calculation shows that it obeys something like a Schrodinger equation with respect to this York time with a Hamiltonian that also has a nice classical meaning. To go back to this question of what time means, you can ask, what if I chose a different slicing? Then I get moduli, then I get tori at constant time with different moduli. They would have different time dependence. They'd have a different uh, Schrodinger equation. But suppose that I want, let's see, does this have a pointer on it? No, okay. Suppose that I want to go from choose your favorite lower slice there to choose your favorite upper slice. Uh, in a way, uh, here's one slicing where I can use the Schrodinger picture to calculate the transition probabilities. Um, suppose I choose a different intermediate slicing, then I'll get a completely different Schrodinger equation. But on the initial slice and on the final slice, it's equivalent to this Heisenberg picture. And so the transition amplitudes, the probab transition probabilities are going to be the same no matter what time coordinate or time slicing you choose in between your initial and final uh, surfaces. So that's a big part of a solution of the problem of time in quantum gravity. It is certainly not ideal. Uh, let me stress the problems here. The reason that I could do this explicitly is that in two plus one dimensions, I know the general classical solution. Three plus one dimensions, I certainly don't. And so you have to ask, is there some approximation, some perturbation theory that you can use here? It's not known. Uh, the classical, the covariant phase space picture is non-local. It's really hard to find local, spatially local operators or uh, even spatially quasi-local quantities which is what we need in practice. Uh, there are other technical problems in quantum gravity having to do with things like renormalizability. And at least in this example, this says nothing about those. But it's an existence proof. It shows that there is possibly a way of solving this problem of time and quantum gravity by I think the key element is by going to covariant phase space, by 
saying that we want to describe quantum theory on the space of solutions, on the space of classical trajectories, and that time dependence then can be described at least almost the same way that you would in classical. Okay, uh, I guess that is it. Uh, thank you. Okay, good. Then we have time for questions. Um, let's see. Uh, Oliver was first, uh, and then Sam, and then Craig. Advantage of giving the first talk after the uh, the conference dinner. <laughs> so thank you. You you invited a question about York time, mm -hmm. and uh, so one thing that's puzzling me is the um, how to think about having different possible slicings. So if your initial slicing involves these flat, spatially flat surfaces. And so the um, phase space is parameterized classically with just a few degrees of freedom. Mm -hmm. Intuitively, if I'm thinking of a different slicing between two such hypersurfaces, they're gonna be variably curved. And so yep. suddenly it's gonna be infinite dimensional. And uh, so, so how does that all work out? Okay. Um, the reason that it works, is that uh, the classical, if you were talking about a slicing of an arbitrary space time, that would cause major problems. But here, we're only slicing classical solutions of the field equations. So it's certainly true that if you choose an intermediate slicing that isn't uh, spatially flat, for instance, that the torus, the, the spatial torus that you get there will be very complicated. Um, the way that that, the form that that will take is that it will still have a modulus, but that the metric will be multiplied by some complicated conformal factor. But the conform, that factor is completely determined by your choice of the slicing and the classical solution. Um, so it's some very complicated function in general, but it's a fixed complicated function. And the quantum mechanics only depends on the part that's separate from that function. In another slightly more technical way of saying that this, uh, the conformal factor for an arbitrary slicing is completely fixed by the constraints. And so it's there, it's a complicated function, but it has no dynamics. You seem satisfied, Oliver. Good, okay, Sam. Yeah, I'm, I'm trying to sort of pin some metaphysics to bits and pieces here. And I, I, so two, I think, related questions. So one of them is, I'm, I'm trying to work out what it means to say that the, the time dependence is coming out of the observables, or the operators over the observables. And I, I mean, it looks a little bit like it's some kind of relationalism or something like a relationalist picture because the time dependence is between the things rather than the, the sort of like it's not showing up in the in the in the in this background space time. Well, it's not a background space time, but the background space, but in the in the objects. But but if it is a kind of relationalism, it, and, and this is the so that was the first question: is this a kind of relationalism? But if it is, if it is, the the it looks like causal order might not be invariant because those uh, because of the the different slicings are going to have, as you said, different Schrodinger equations, different time dependent equations. And is that what's going to happen? You're going to have causal order between the things changing as you go through the slicing? Okay, so for the first answer, I do, uh, I'm not enough of a, an expert on the philosophy to say for sure, but yes, I think that it is a relational picture. 
Uh, give me a second to think about this. Um, yeah, so I don't know quite how to describe this in the right terminology. But what's going on here is that the meaning of your observables is determined by what the, even though this is a quantum theory, the meaning of your observables is determined by what they mean in a, a classical space time. And in that classical space time, uh, they, in the classical space time, there is an implicit assumption that if for a given set of, of, of observables, there's an implicit assumption that you've identified some choice of time which means that you've identified some way of synchronizing your clocks and the meaning of the observables is given, is, de is determined by the meaning of that, or is at least is constrained by the meaning of that choice of clocks. So it's at least relational in, in some sense. Causal order, uh, I think it, it's, you're probably not allowed in a single classical solution to take slices that actually cross each other in which you have a uh, change in causal order. But you can certainly ask for uh, cases where you have a superposition of wave functions in which causal orders, uh, causal ordering of events is different. Um, there is a bunch of recent literature in the quantum mechanics uh, uh, community, not even quantum gravity, about how to make physical sense of such superpositions, which as I mentioned at the beginning, actually have been constructed uh, experimentally. You can have a superposition of a state where a particle goes through gate A and then gate B and a state where it goes through gate B and then gate A. So oh, that's, that's cool. Can I just ask one quick Follow up about the relational um, question. All these things you're talking about are um, just quantized geometry, right? We don't have matter degrees of freedom in these models. Well, in the simple example that I just gave, we don't have matter degrees of freedom. But in principle, there's nothing wrong. There is no difficulty in no adding additional matter here. Uh, the basic uh, for example, the, the Hamiltonian is still, the, the full Hamiltonian is still going to be identically zero. Uh, it's still going to be true that uh, you can try to, to define time in terms of clocks, but you have back reactions. Um, nothing, nothing that I said here except for the particular example requires that there's no matter. Okay, thanks. Uh, oh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, thank you. That was a really beautiful talk. Um, you know, of course, uh, when you're sitting here, uh, you, you're, I mean, you're trying to think, well, what, you know, is when I, when you drop down to two plus one instead of three plus one, is, you know, are you getting uh, differences of uh, just sort of the technical things, or is it more like they're, some sort of in principle thing that is being missed. And so, um, so I can see certain differences, you know, so if I think of, uh, if I turn on some strong curvature, you know, then for instance, the, the York 
exfoliation will get, well, to use a technical term, uh, weird. <laughs> and, <laughs> and does that, you know, but maybe there are other things. And so my question is really to, you know, since you've thought about this the most, my question is really to turn this around and have you ask the, you know, what, it, what is the sort of, uh, yeah, are there are there things that worry you that make you think that, that this is a kind of in principle that it's sort of in principle missing the solution rather than than not? Yeah. Uh, so the things that worry me are first of all one related to to what you said at the beginning that in two plus one dimensions uh, the choice of York time is a good choice for the entire set of classical solutions. In three plus one dimensions, it's not clear. It, there isn't a known, easily defined at least, choice of affoliation that carries over across all classical solutions. The nearest thing is this cosmological time that got mentioned uh, Monday, which is basically uh, extremal proper time from the Big Bang to a point. That probably works, but is incredibly hard to use in practice. Uh, the other thing that worries me is that um, in, a, in any complicated quantum theory, there is always an ambiguity that comes from operator order. Um, for most quantum field theories of the type that we deal with ordinarily, that's fairly easy to handle. It only causes a finite number of uncertain constants, of arbitrary constants. Here, there's a lot of non-locality. And as a result, the operator ordering problems potentially become infinitely hard. And so this comes back to the question of whether there's some perturbation theory that makes sense that can bring this under control. I don't know. Thanks. Uh, any other questions? Okay, let's give a big wait. Thank you. Just very quickly, can you go back to your first slides? The very first? Yeah, the very beginning, when you mentioned the fact that, you know, there are different, uh, well, no, sorry, the second then, second one, no, the third. Okay, the third, yeah. Okay. Um, so here you, you mentioned the, <clears throat> the fact that states are timeless, um, of course, uh, I want to ask you because it's a you know it's a timeless that uh, you underlined here and so timelessness uh, I think is a is a very important um, concept uh, especially for philosophers who want to either collaborate with physicists but also who want to interpret in a sense what uh, we are doing what you are doing. Um, in quantum gravity. And I would like to know, uh, in your view, this timelessness, how, I mean, uh, here you said from where it comes from, in a sense, but uh, I would like to know what you think about it, whether there is a need uh, from the physicist community uh, to interact with philosophers and better determine this timelessness how do we have to think of it? What we can say or what we cannot say of it? Mm -hmm. So that's my last uh, question. Okay. So what I mean specifically here by timelessness, uh, I could also say spacelessness. Um, what, what I mean is that there is no dependence on uh, any, there, there is no coordinate dependence. And the way that 
in physics that time usually appears is as a coordinate. Uh, so any conventional use of time in physics fails here. But the same is true of any conventional use of space that the, the constraints also tell us that, uh, that um, a spatial coordinate has no physical meaning and that therefore uh, observables in quantum gravity can't depend on individual points in space. They have to be non-local and things like that. Uh, one of the ways of implementing this, which is the one that I'm advocating here, is to make the wave function a function of entire classical solutions because the entire classical trajectory doesn't depend on time or position. It's just, it, it is what it is. Uh, but of course, when we do, when we make observations, when we try to do anything with this, we need to put in something that matches our sense of time. And this is where I do think that this is a relationalist uh, picture that uh, we, by in choosing time dependent observables, what we're doing is saying that we're choosing some way of specifying how to synchronize clocks, if you like, classically, and then making quantum observables that take advantage of that. Um, for the quantum gravity community as a whole, I think that you'll find no agreement whatsoever on uh, what should be, how we should be treating time. Uh, I mean, there is certainly a general agreement that there is a problem here. Uh, but I don't think there's anything close to a consensus. Okay, uh, Oliver has a quick follow-up. Um, I have to give you the the mic. Uh, yeah, so I was just going to say that I I think. Um, uh, the question is, is the following right? So it seems that the picture you're presenting is no more timeless than, as you say, the kind of block universe way of thinking about space time. Uh, thinking of the block universe, that doesn't evolve, um, but you're having uh, operators associated with one time slice and another, and that's giving you a probability, uh, transi a transition probability, and you're showing how it doesn't depend on the intervening slicing. So it, it looks no more timeless than standard classical block universe picture. So it's not really some kind of mysterious, how do we get time from this timeless quantum gravity? Is, it, is, that, is that the picture you have? Um, sort of. <laughs> uh, it, if you like what I'm doing is starting with a picture like that, but then showing that you can then transform to a picture which is much more like a, an ordinary Schrodinger picture in which you have time dependent states that evolve from one time to another. You can do that in an infinite number of different ways that all agree with each other. So if you like, what I'm saying is that this choice between a block universe and an evolving present uh, is just is just as much there in quantum gravity as it is anywhere else. But that we have but that, but that we have a way of uh, 
moving back and forth between those pictures that is consistent and sensible. Okay. We, we really know what to mean philosophically. Thanks. We have to let's uh, thank Steve. <laughs>